Good morning again. We're, this morning we're continuing the series that uh, we've been doing over the last um, few weeks, looking at the claims of Jesus to be I am various things. I am the light. I am the good shepherd. I am the uh, true vine. I am the way, the truth and the life. And this morning we're going to be looking at his claim, I am the resurrection and the life. These are very, very familiar words uh, to all of us. Anybody who's attended a Christian funeral will have heard them read out as, as words of comfort and bereavement. And they, they go along with uh, Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and death has no power over us. But how do we know that that's more than just a pious hope? Well, this uh, chapter 11 of John is a kind of show and tell of the, uh, of the truth of Jesus' statement that he's the, the resurrection and the life. We need to put the story into context. In chapter 10, Jesus goes to Jerusalem to the Feast of Dedication in the temple. And in the temple... The Jews come up to him and they surround him and they say, look, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, say so clearly. Tell us plainly. And Jesus says, well, you can see the miracles. You, you've seen what I've done. Isn't that enough for you? He goes on to say, these miracles show that I and my father are one and the Jews understand exactly what he's saying. This is not any vague statement. Jesus is claiming to be God, to be equal with God. And to the Jews, this is an absolute blasphemy. So they pick up stones and try to stone him, but he escapes. And he leaves Jerusalem and he goes and he crosses to the other side of Jordan, about a day's journey away from Jerusalem. It's out of the territory of Judea. It's in the territory that's ruled by Herod Antipas. And the Jewish authorities, the Jerusalem authorities, have absolutely no authority there. So they can't touch Jesus while he's uh, on the other side of the Jordan. So that's the sort of background. And then we come to John 11. And in John 11, we're introduced to the family in Bethany, Mary, Martha and Lazarus. We've met Mary and Martha before in Luke chapter 10. And Jesus is a visitor in their home. It seems as if that home in, uh, in Bethany is somewhere where Jesus is a regular visitor. It's somewhere where he can relax, where he can feel at home, where he is loved and where he in turn loves them. In Luke chapter 10, we have the picture of the two sisters and their contrasting characters. Martha is the doer. And because Jesus is visiting, she is rushing around, making preparations, getting the meal ready, setting the table. And Mary is sat by Jesus talking to him. Now, people sort of put all sorts of spiritual things on. Mary was listening to Jesus teaching. It doesn't say she was. She's just sitting at his feet talking to him. And it can be very frustrating if you're a doer to see somebody who's just sat around listening. I know that because I'm a doer. And Martha complains to Jesus, Lord, tell Mary to come and help me. And Jesus says, look, Martha, you're far too busy. Mary's done the right thing. I've been to homes where the hostess is a wonderful hostess. She enjoys having people. She looks after them very well. But when you go there, she's so busy rushing around, making sure everything's okay for you, that you never get a chance to talk to her. And I have on occasions felt like screaming, oh, just sit down and let's just chat. I come to see you. I'm not come for the food. Well, that's not actually true because she was a wonderful cook and the food was part of what I come for. But I really wanted to spend time with her. 
Isn't that awfully like us? We're so busy doing things for Jesus, trying to please him, trying to make sure that everything's happening the way that he would want it to happen, that we forget to sit and listen to him. And Jesus says to Martha, Mary's doing the right thing. She's listening. In John chapter 11, we meet their brother Lazarus. We haven't met him before and we don't know much about him. We're just told that Lazarus is ill. And the sister's reaction is immediate. They send word to Jesus. This must have been a serious illness because they know that Jesus has gone across the Jordan for safety's sake, to be out of the hands of the, the Jewish authorities. And yet they're so desperate, they feel the need to send for him. And all they do is send a simple message. Lord, the one you love is sick. There's no plea, Jesus, will you come? There's no plea, Jesus, will you heal him? It's just that expectation that if we tell him that Lazarus is sick, then he'll do something about it. The messengers arrive and Jesus immediately says, this sickness will not end in death. I'm sure the disciples interpreted that as we would. Lazarus is going to recover from his illness. Perhaps the disciple, perhaps the messengers headed back to Martha and Mary to say, Jesus says it's going to be all right. Lazarus uh, is not going to die. But then something strange happens because Jesus doesn't do anything. He stays where he is for two days. It's not because he doesn't care for Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Because John says quite clearly, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Some people say that the translation should be not yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, but therefore, because he loved them, therefore he stayed where he was for two more days. Why? It doesn't seem to make any sense at all. And sometimes we find ourselves in that position, don't we? There is something that we have prayed for and prayed earnestly for. And nothing seems to happen. God doesn't seem to hear our prayers. God doesn't seem to intervene. He doesn't seem to do anything. And we're, we're completely baffled by this. The disciples might well have thought, well, of course Jesus is not going to go back because if he does, he's going to get arrested. And we can understand why he's not going back. And after all, he could actually heal Lazarus without going back because we know from other stories that Jesus healed people at a distance. The centurion sent uh, to say to Jesus, my servant is uh, sick, will, will you heal him? But I don't want you to come to my house. And Jesus says, well, fine, go back. And when you get back to your house, you'll find that your servant is healed. So was Jesus going to heal Lazarus without actually going to Judea? And then the mystery deepens further. Because after this two days delay, Jesus says to the disciples, right, let's go back to Judea. The disciples immediately protest, but, but teacher, they say, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, yet you're going back there? And then Jesus replies rather enigmatically, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It's when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. What's Jesus saying? Well, in John chapter 9 and verse 4, he says, As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. The night is coming 
when no one can work. Jesus is saying, if we're going to do God's work, if we're going to do God's will, we've got to go back to Judea because that's what God's will is at this moment in time. And that is walking in the light. No matter what we might be facing, if what we're doing is in God's will, then it's the right thing to do. It doesn't actually guarantee a safety. It's just that it's the right thing to do. He goes on to say, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going there to wake him. And again, you can imagine the disciples' puzzlement. Um, one, if he's asleep, this is a good thing. If somebody's been ill and then they're asleep, they're going to recover. And if he's asleep, why are we taking a whole day's journey just to wake him up? He'll wait long before we get there, won't we? Jesus says, no, he's actually dead. And again, we've got these poor old disciples. They never quite grasp what Jesus is saying. But let's not criticise them. Because we're often the same, aren't we? We really don't always understand what it is that God's saying to us. And sometimes we just have to be told very bluntly and very plainly. But Jesus says, for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Well, what's that all about? What's Jesus actually saying? He's not glad that Lazarus has died and that his sisters are grieving. But he is glad that what he knows is going to happen, the miracle of Lazarus being raised, will strengthen the faith of the disciples. And one would hope that Having seen that, then they're going to have their faith strengthened in the future. Although their track record on having their faith strengthened by seeing what Jesus did, did is not always good. Do you remember Jesus fed the 5,000 and they saw the miracle of him feeding 5,000 people with two loaves and uh, with five loaves and two small fish. And then some weeks later, there are 4,000 people being taught and they're hungry and Jesus says, feed them. And they say, but how? They've forgotten already. And again, it's very easy for us to do that. God moves in our lives in wonderful ways. And then when the next crisis arises, we forget he's done it. And we get all of a panic again and, and wonder how we can cope. And so, verse 17, Jesus arrives at Bethany. And when he gets there, he finds that Lazarus has already been dead for four days. Now, I think he probably knew that anyway. But if we actually work out what's happened, Mary and Martha sent messengers to Jesus. It was a day's journey for them to get to Jesus. Jesus waited two days, and then it's a day's journey for, G for um, Jesus to get to Bethany. Four days. So in fact, Lazarus must have died very shortly after the messengers set off to find Jesus. And when the messengers came to Jesus, Lazarus was already dead. And when Jesus made the statement, this illness is not going to end in death, he already knew that Lazarus was dead. He already was aware that what he was going to do was something even greater than raise Lazarus from a bed of sickness. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the grave. And again we see the two sisters. 
Martha, the doer, hears that Jesus has come to the village and immediately gets up and goes out to meet him. Mary, the quiet one, stares at home. And this interaction between Martha and Jesus is absolutely wonderful. We've got this real sort of mixture of faith and doubt. She comes to Jesus and she says, if only you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. A kind of, a little bit of reproach. Jesus, why weren't you here? But then she goes on, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Is she actually saying to Jesus, I know that you can raise him from the dead? I can't think what else it is that she's saying. And Jesus responds to her, your brother will rise again. Martha, who has just said, I know that God will give you whatever you ask, falls back on orthodoxy. She can't really believe that Lazarus will rise there and then. She goes back to her good old biblical beliefs and says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Again, we can't blame Martha because it's the way we act, isn't it? We pray for something. We get the promise that it will be given to us. And then we just go back to a kind of head belief. We don't really expect that the thing we've prayed for is going to happen. And Jesus' response to her is this statement that we're thinking about today. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You see, Jesus is not promising Martha that some external power is going to be exercised on her behalf. He is promising her that he is the complete answer to her problem. It is he who will bring life to her brother. And that's just wonderful, isn't it? You see, when we actually ask for God's help, What we get is not some display of his power. It is he himself coming in power. And that's a very different sort of story. And uh, Martha's response is, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. Of course I believe you're the resurrection and the life. I believe you are the Son of God. Her faith soars again. But following that high point of faith, a little bit later when they come to the tomb and Jesus says, take away the stone, Martha says, but but Lord, there'll be a bad odour. He's been dead for four days. I believe God can answer your prayers. I believe you are the son of God. But when it comes to the crunch, I'm not really certain that you are able to raise Lazarus. Can you relate to that? That sort of wonderful mixture of faith and doubt. And Jesus doesn't criticise her. He just says, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Martha, just Just believe. It's going to happen. Mary is still at home. Martha goes back to her and says, Mary, the teacher's asking for you. And so Mary then responds and goes to meet Jesus. And she says almost exactly the same thing that her sister said. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. 
it is a kind of faith, isn't it? If only you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus doesn't respond to her, doesn't directly address her the way he does with Martha. It says that when he sees her weeping, he is deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he bursts into tears. It's one of the most poignant moments in the whole of the gospel story. Jesus has just declared to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus knows that he is about to raise Lazarus, but still his heart is touched with that deep, deep compassion for Mary and her suffering. And he responds by himself weeping. Isn't that amazing? Whatever we are feeling, the Lord feels it as well. The ancient Greeks believed that the gods were completely impassive. Nothing moved them, nothing changed them, nothing altered them. But we have a God who experiences all our emotions, our grief, our joy. He shares it. And that's just wonderful. And then we come to the, the show and tell part of the story. Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he says. Jesus could have commanded Lazarus to come out through of the grave and the stone wouldn't have stopped him. Jesus could have commanded the stone to roll away and the stone would have rolled away. But Jesus says to the people, you do what you can, and then I'll do what I can. And that is still the way he works. Sometimes when we're sitting back praying for God to act, he's saying to us, take away the stone, and then I'll get on with it. There are things that he, can, that he expects us to do as part of our cooperation in his work. We're not called to sit back as spectators and watch God work miracles and do wonders. We're called to join in and do what we can. And then he does the rest. They rolled the stone away and Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. Why did Jesus do that? He wanted the people to realise that he wasn't just a, a magic worker. He wasn't just some sort of showman, but that what he was doing was doing the work that God had sent him to do. And he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Somebody said, if he hadn't said, Lazarus come out, if he just said, come out, the entire graveyard would have got up. But he calls Lazarus out, and then again, he tells the people to do what they can, take his grave clothes off. Again, Jesus could have told the grave clothes to drop away, and they would have done. But he invites the people to join in the work, and to do what they can. So... When Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he actually shows clearly that this is true because he raises Lazarus from the dead. Somebody who'd been dead for four days. The Jewish rabbis taught that after four days, the soul had ceased to hang around the body and the body had started to decompose. And Jesus says, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter how impossible it is. I can raise the dead. But what does that mean for us, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? 
two things. One is, it does give us comfort in bereavement, because death for the Christian is not the end. When we die, we go to be in the presence of the Lord. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But it's more than that. It speaks to us of transformation now in this present life. Because Jesus is in the business of resurrecting those who are dead in sins. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4 says, You were dead in your transgressions and sins, gratifying the cravings of our old nature and following its desires and thoughts. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's been grace, it's by grace you have been saved. So Jesus resurrects us. He raises us from the death of sin and transgression and makes us alive and gives us a new life. That's what being a Christian is. Being a Christian is not about trying to be good. It's not about trying to keep the rules. It's not about f trying to reform our lives. Being a Christian is about realising that you are dead to God. That the th way you think, the way you live, your whole attitude and your whole behaviour is a block between you and God. But Jesus makes us alive so that we know God and we live with God and we experience God. And Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you know, do you know that for yourself? If you are a Christian, are you experiencing that new life in Christ? Or are you still struggling to live the Christian life on your own? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And if we believe in him, we'll never die. But we'll live with him for all eternity. What a wonderful thing to look forward to. Amen.